At this point, we'll now go ahead and try to build the block diagram, the simulation model that we drew by hand within Simulink. So Simulink is an addition to MATLAB. We can open it in two ways. One is we can type Simulink at the command line and hit enter. We can also go up to the toolbar and click on this icon. Once it opens, we give, we're given a few options. We want to just create a new blank model. Once this is open, we then want to start to put the blocks into our block diagram. So one way to access the different blocks within Simulink is to go up here to the library browser. You can see that there are different menus or different submenus. You can access them on the right or along the left. You can also type up here in the search menu to search for the name of a block that you might be interested in. We're going to start with the input to our system. And so you can think of an input as a source. So I click on that menu. There are lots of different sources you can see. You know, there's ramps, there's pulses, there's sine waves. Our input is going to be a step. So I can click on that and I can drag it into our window. If I double click on the block, I can change its parameters. So this step has an initial value of zero and it steps to one. So it's just a unit step. That step occurs at time t equals one second. And so that's fine for us. If I click underneath um, on the label of the block, I can change that. I'm going to just give it the label u because that's what we call the input. The next block that we need is a summing junction. So again, we can go to the library browser. In this case, it would be under the math sublibrary. Instead, I'm going to double click into my window and I'm going to start typing the name of what I think the block might be. So I type sum. There's a block called sum. And so that's our summing junction. We can connect our input to the summing junction. Um, if you recall, the signal that we're going to feed back, we need to subtract. So we can change the sign on the second input by double clicking on the block, changing that second addition sign to a subtraction sign. You can add more than two um, inputs. You can add these bars to shift around where the inputs enter on the circle. The next thing that we need is an integrator block. If you recall, integration in the time domain is division by S in the Laplace domain. And so that's why the integrator block is shown as being 1 divided by S. This signal in our block diagram is x dot. And so if I double click again, um, instead of just typing immediately, I'm going to click on create annotation. And so I can add the label x dot. That doesn't change how the simulation performs. It's just a label to make our simulation model more understandable. If x dot is being integrated, if x dot is the input to our integration, the output then is just going to be x because uh, integration is the inverse operation of differentiation. So that x signal, we then want to feed back and put through a gain. So again, the block is called gain. If you remember back to what we drew, we want our gain to be five. I actually want to flip that gain because I want the input to be X and I want the output to go to the summing junction. So if I right click on the block, pulls up this menu, I go to rotate and flip, and I can flip the block. I can also achieve that by selecting the block and typing Control I. So that flipped it. I can then branch off our X signal by right clicking on that signal and connecting it. And I can take the output and connect it to the summing junction. So this, as we've drawn it, is a model of our differential equation. We want to go a step further, though, and we want to actually um, be able to look at the output or look at the signals. And so in particular, we want to look at the single signal X. You know, you can think of that as being the output of our system. You can think of that as being the solution to the differential equation. So one way to do this is to use the scope block. So the scope block allows you to look at a graph right within Simulink. 
Um, so if I come up here there to the toolbar, um, one thing that you might want to change is the stop time. So here we're going to run our simulation for 10 seconds of simulated time. That's, that's good for us, so I'll keep it at 10. We'll then hit the run button. And so um, that will run the simulation. You can see there's some things happening, and it happens very quickly. Um, so this is a very simple model. And so we are able to run, you know, simulate 10 seconds of time very quickly, you know, in, in a fraction of a second. If I double click on the scope, I then get a graph of what X is. Um, so along the X axis is time, the Y axis is our X values. And so this is what we would expect. Um, so if you think back to the solution of a differential equation, if you think back to the output of a dynamic system, it'll have two parts to it. One part will be the homogeneous solution or the natural dynamics of the system. The other part will be the particular solution due to the forcing input. And so in this case, our homogeneous solution based on the roots of the characteristic equation is e to the minus 5t. So it's a decaying exponential. The forcing input is a step. So the particular solution will also be a step or a constant. And so if you look at this shape, you might be able to imagine that it's the difference between a, a step. Um, so it's like a step subtracting a decaying exponential. And that's how we get that shape. Another way to look at our signals is to bring them into the MATLAB workspace. And so in this case, I'm gonna add a block to workspace. I'm gonna connect that. If I double click on it, I'm gonna change the variable name to X. And you can see that the format that it's being saved in is something called a time series. So I run the simulation again give the same value of x. If I look at the scope, it has the same shape. But now if I come into MATLAB, I can see in the workspace there is something called out. And so that out is a structure that includes the output of our simulation. And in particular, I'm interested in something in this x. And so this x is our time series that we just saved. And the way we access this level underneath we type out dot x. So that dot x takes us to um, takes us within the out structure. And so if we look at this time series, it includes two things. So it includes a vector of time values, and it includes a vector of data. And so that is um, our x values. So there's 54 instances of time. Um, and then there's an X value that goes with each instant of time. Before we were able to plot data using the plot command. Um, and the way that we did that is we gave it two arrays. We gave it an array of X, X data and an array of Y data. In this case, I can just give it the time series out X, and it's smart enough to extract the time information and the data information and plot it point by point. And so we get the same shape that we saw in the scope. Going back to our simulation, um, let's say that we want to add an initial condition to our system. So we can set initial conditions within the integrator block. So I double click on the integrator block. I'm gonna set the initial condition to be 0 0.05. So what you can imagine is every, every step in the simulation where we're sort of um, doing increments of time, delta t's, and estimating what the next value of x is, the very first time the simulation runs, the very first value of x that's spit out is that initial condition. So I rerun. If I look at my scope, this is the shape that we would expect. So for that first second, there is no input. The step has not stepped yet. And so we just have the homogeneous solution. We just have the natural free response of the system, which is a decaying exponential. And then when the step comes in at time equals one, that's when we get this new shape. Sometimes you may wanna change the parameters of your simulation. 
So if we go to modeling and model settings, we can click on this model settings menu. In general, the default values that MATLAB uses is very good. So the default solver that it uses is very good. The default size of step that it chooses is very good. And so, you know, when it uses a variable step, what it's doing is it's trying to use the largest step that it can while keeping um, the output accurate. You know, so you want to remember that simulation is a numerical approximation. And so the accuracy of the simulation of the approximation is depends on how big the time step is. We're going to go ahead and force it to use a fixed step solver. And, you know, if you look, you could see the different solvers. So here's the Euler solver, which was the very simple solver that we explained a little bit in class in our lecture. So I'll keep it auto. And I'm going to go ahead, click on the solver details, and I'm going to force it to use a smaller time step, 0 0.01. So um, again, I'm going to run my, I'm going to go back to my simulation menu and I'm going to run it again. So I go back to Simulink, I go back to MATLAB. And so this was our original, this was when we used the default MATLAB solver. And you can see that it's, um, it's not completely smooth. So the MATLAB solver is choosing to use sort of relatively big jumps in time. Um, and so you can kind of see these little corners on it where there's each, each point of data. Now that we've rerun it, we, re, we wrote over the output. So now it has the new output where we forced it to use a smaller step size. And so now if you look at this graph, you can see that it's smoother because it's, it's forcing the system, the simulation to use many more points. So that is a kind of our introduction to um, Simulink. This was, you know, returning to our PowerPoint slides, this was what we were trying to recreate. And, um, you know, we were successful at that. The response that we saw matched sort of the prediction of what we thought the solution of the differential equation, what the output was gonna be. And so in conclusion, um, in model, module seven, we, we reintroduced the notion of black box modeling. Um, in particular, we talked about it in the context of, of modeling batteries. Um, and one of the, the real advantages of using black box modeling was that we can generate a model without understanding the underlying physics. So even if we don't understand the chemistry of batteries, we were able to get a model. In general, um, if our model is applied under similar conditions to the experiment that we used to derive the model, it can be quite accurate. The challenge is if we try to apply it over a broader range of conditions, it may not be very accurate if our experiment, if our model doesn't capture like relevant um, variables, you know, if it depends on temperature and we don't include temperature in our model or whatever. Um, the advantages of a first principles approach is that um, you understand things much better. So like with a black box model, you know, if we have a five as a coefficient in our equation, we don't necessarily understand what that five represents. Um, with the first principles approach, we have much more intuition about the physics. We then introduce the idea of numerical simulation as a way to approximate solutions to problems that are too complicated to solve by hand. Um, so that's the purpose of numerical simulation. We showed some different ways to architect a simulation, forward-looking versus backward-looking. And then we talked about differential equation models versus transfer function models. So we just created a differential equation model of, in Simulink. We were able to include an initial condition. We could have modeled a nonlinearity. With a transfer function, you can't do that. But transfer functions are algebraic, which is an advantage, and they are easier for combining subsystems. That's something we will get to later.